Okay, the recording started. And let's go through some of the slides here. Uh, I also want you to notice, note that the slides um, and the, the publisher is a few years old. So there's a lot of things that have changed uh, in the industry uh, that are different now. Than, and I'll introduce those pieces as we go along in this, in this lecture. I'll do a, a maybe uh, I'll finish up maybe 4, 4.15 today, and then um, we'll finish up on Thursday. So let's go into a little bit of a history of what a mortgage is. Um, and these statistics here on this slide are pretty consistent. Um, about 75% of all mortgages are for single family dwellings. That's mom and pop. That's us just by getting a mortgage. A mortgage is a special loan. It's a long-term loan uh, with a dwelling that is a house a dwelling that's the security so you may you buy the house but you will also have a loan to help purchase it and that's a mortgage um it's long term meaning it's a 15 uh, some loans are 15 years 30 years 20 years we're talking long term um like a bond uh it's a similar thing but bonds are unsecured generally and a mortgage is secured um, and it's much longer term than car loans, which you probably you might be able to get a seven year on a new car might get up to seven years and good credit. But you're looking at about a five year uh, max. Uh, most places only give five years on a car loan. Um, now, there are other types of security when it comes to a mortgage. There are apartment buildings or income uh, resident uh, rental income property can get a mortgage. Uh, commercial buildings, office buildings, they can have uh, mortgages. Uh, you can have a mortgage on a farm too. Now, a farm is a kind of unique, even though it is a, usually a single family dwelling, but the entire farm is also an income generating uh, asset. That means that the farmer is going to farm and sell the produce, and that is going to generate. So it's in a way of an investment, but the investment is still the principal plus the interest, just like any other loan. Uh, the, the concept of the mortgage was started by back in the 1800s, late 1800s, more like most likely. And um, it became very hard shortly after their existence when the, there was the agricultural recession, which is very short, but the farmers were having trouble farming, so they couldn't pay their mortgages, so they defaulted. Um, and until World War II, they were all very short loans with balloons. Now, a balloon is where it's amortized or the interest is calculated at, for a longer term, but you're actually paying that in a very short amount of time. Uh, let me demonstrate on the board here what I'm trying to say. It might help. It might help understand this. So just a second. There we go. What I'm trying to say is that uh, you mortgage, let's say you get a $200,000 mortgage, okay? And your loan is what's called a 720 balloon. That means that you're paying, the, uh, you're going to make seven years of payments and, but the loan is amortized or it, the interest is calculated based on the 20 years, if you were to pay in 20 years. So your mortgage payment, your principal and interest is as if you were paying in 20 years, but you only pay in seven. But see, at the end of seven, on that seventh year, seventh payment, seventh year payments, then you have the remaining balance of that whole loan that is due at that time which gives you some time to, uh, it, it, what it does is um, uh, one idea is that for new uh, young families um, that are not very secure in their jobs or have very low, lower paying jobs, 
they still can afford the mortgage and still get the benefits of how home um, ownership of a home and you can write out and pay a smaller portion of your budget in the seven years and then have an opportunity to even build up your credit and have an improved credit in by the time the balloon it's time to refinance that into that in the balloon um the other thing is that the mortgage company or bank the financial institution is only invested for seven years instead of a whole 20 or 30 years so they have to wait for that money to be returned sort of and um so the it works both ways the borrower who's borrowing the money and the lender or the institution are only invested for seven years and interest rates could change in seven years it could improve or meaning they could drop by then and if you time it right you could try to get a lower interest rate than when you started this balloon in the first place so balloons with maturities of when i say maturity it means that at the end of the seven years it's considered matured but you still have a huge balance to work off um, and refinance. That's the concept of a balloon loan. Is they still exist. And they exist in many cases in commercial loans, uh, business loans, uh, commercial buildings, because they're income generating, your resident, um, uh, their um, rental income, and because their rental income, you can you can constantly, as the landlord, every year increase the rent, yet your mortgage payments are the same. So you're putting more and more aside for a future balloon. Conceptually, you could pay off a balloon. You could refinance or sell that income property with a huge profit at a new market and pay off that balloon. It just doesn't commit both parties long term. That's the concept of a balloon loan. Oops. Sorry, they're drifting. The big problem post World War II, or I mean, sorry, prior to the World War II with these balloon loans that are out there, is when during the Great Depression, which was 1929 to 1935, what happened was people were losing jobs. We had a 25% unemployment rate. Only 75% of the labor force were employed, and I wouldn't even say they were fully employed. So we had uh, people that were out of work. Uh, so they weren't paying back the loans. So we had toxic assets um, that the um, banks were sh saddled with. Banks, non-performing loans, and they were just apprehensive of sell, uh, lending anymore. So it put a big hold on the banking industry. That was also before the uh, banking industry and the Federal Reserve actually had enough teeth, enough power to enforce a, a concept we, talk, we talked about before that required reserve. Remember when we were talking about money and banking, uh, that the Federal Reserve, they have four tools in their toolkit, and one of them is required reserve or vault limit. Well, that didn't exist during the Great Depression, which means that banks were getting uh, having runs against the banks. People were running to the bank to take all their money, but there was no money in the bank because they lent it all out. And they, the lending out happened, then nobody was paying back the loans. So we had people that were borrowing money, 100% of the money that was in deposit was lent out, but not getting paid back, and people wanted their deposit back because they wanted to hold cash. They wanted to hold currency and not have it sitting in the bank. Nobody, and so it just caused more and more problems, which created more um, after this. And then in the early 30s, uh, Congress enacted more powerful legislation to help the Federal Reserve avoid some of these things. Um, and that's when we got the 30-year mortgage that we know today. That's what in, instituted that. So um, let's talk about mortgage interest rates. Basically, um, interest rates on mortgages are generally pegged to, uh, or a, uh, a number of points above the six month T bill. Uh, not really treasury bonds, but the bills. So whatever is current, um, 
each institution has a different bill, but it's a six month T bill at that time. What is the yield on the T bill plus two or three percentage points on top of it? That's kind of where it is. It's not too concerning what that is, but it does help to know if you're following the yield curve uh, of the, um, the treasury bills, the six month treasury bill, then you an can anticipate the trajectory of mortgage rates that will be in the um, industry or in that in the mortgage market. Um, if they're longer term, they tend to have higher interest rates. And then we have a concept called discount points where you pay upfront in cash a percentage of the loan um, that will also equate uh, cash upfront that will equate to that many points reduction in the rate. So if you're offered a 9% loan, but you pay two points, then you take two percentage points off the top, and now you have a 7% loan, but you pay 2% of your loan amount in your closing right away. So uh, in my previous example of 200,000, you have to pay um, $4,000 in the closing cost. You pay 4,000 today, and you don't have to pay 2% or only have to pay 7% in interest for the life of the loan. Uh, so it's a way of reducing it, but also gives uh, an incentive cash to the bank right immediately as well, up beyond you know, your payments, above, beyond your payments. So it's, it's a decision. Is there, uh, is seven, the interest you're saving, the 2% savings equal to, uh, or more than, uh, the four thousand dollars you have to pay that's part of a decision um this chart is showing the uh general trend of the treasury yields and uh, the mortgage rates over time uh from the great big time when it was really the highest in uh, american history really uh back in the late 70s early 80s and the volcker in um, time when volcker uh, paul volcker was the Fed chair, and we experienced high inflation, high unemployment, the stagflation, and high interest rates. Because as you remember with the Fisher equation, nominal minus um, inflation is equal to our real interest rate. So in nominal interest rates will be, you can think about the other way, opposite, um, real plus inflation equals nominal. So our nominal rates are going up because our inflation was going up. And we're seeing that today, Right now, mortgage rates are going up because the Fed just last Wednesday uh, raised interest rates again by a three quarters of a point. And that's the, the, the main lending rate, uh, the rate that uh, credit cards charge, uh, the rate that uh, is suggested that banks use as a target rate for them to you know, work off of. I wouldn't say the prime lending rate, that's a different lending rate. Um, that's usually for uh, adjustable or rever uh, uh, um, yeah, adjusted mortgages or uh, variable rate mortgages. So here's an example. Let's talk this one through. Suppose you had a choice between a 12% 30-year mortgage or an 11 and a half uh, mortgage with a 2% with 2% discount, and you're char you're borrowing the same amount. They're both 30 years. One is a 12% and one's an 11 and a half percent. Um, and you're borrowing $100,000, which would you choose? Now, you remember that if you're going to have an interest rate with 2% discount or two discount points, that means you're taking 2% and paying upfront that 2%, and the interest rate is reduced. So here's the calculation for what is your payment, your monthly payment, if you had a 12% annual. Remember that any, di any um, interest rate that's listed or uh, stated is stated an annual. So this is why it's they use 12 just to, because then it's easy to, to uh, make it a monthly 1%. Um, this is a, an example right here of the freak. If you remember my TVM lecture, uh, the freak is monthly. Uh, so interest is calculated monthly. So we divide the interest rate by the freak and we multiply the number of years by the freak. So 30 times 12 is 360, and 12 divided by 12 is 1. So that's where you get these characters. Uh, you could use a calculator. Even a computer calculator can do this. Uh, you can use this Excel. Um, 
no, your computer calculator wouldn't be able to do it, but you could calculate this. So if they did a straight 12% loan for uh, 30 years at 100%, 100 excuse me, $100,000 at 12% for 30 years, calculated uh, uh, um, uh, compounded monthly, you're going to pay $1,028.61 or about $1,030 a month. Okay. So paying the points will save you 38. Oops. I skipped it. Sorry. Here it is. So if we did 11%, 11.5% um, for 30 years, that will um, that payment will be $990 instead of $1,030. So about $40 difference. Approximately $40 difference. And all you have to do is pay $2,000 up front. If you calculate that $40 over 30 years, um, well, is that equal to or greater than the 2,000 you just spent? You probably saved more. Uh, surely you've saved more um, than that on the difference in payments, the difference in interest. So that's why people tend to go towards the discount. The thing is that the discount must be paid up front meaning at the time of closing you have to pay that not the the points you have to pay the points in your closing cost when you're closing and signing for the the hundred thousand dollars part of what you have to bring is those that two thousand dollars the two points that's the other side of it and that's got to be paid in cash because they can't they're not going to roll that into the loan just pay the extra two percent or half percent If you're thinking about not investing long enough, you have to figure out how much savings is equal to or greater than 2000 and target that's your longer term plan of when you're really gonna move out so that you kind of made up that 2000 and this interest savings, that $40 a month. We could easily figure out what $40 a month, how, how long it would be before 2000. Take $2,000 divided by 40, uh, which gives us um, 200 divided by 4 is 25, 50. So in 50 months, you had made up that $2,000 approximately. 50 months is four years so in four years you've made up the two thousand dollars a little over four years you've made up the two thousand dollars and so that's when you want to move out because you've collected or saved that much in interest um effective rate is the nominal rate versus the effective rate incorporates um, the amount of interest from time of closing. Um, it adds in that too, and it also considers um, also in this case, it considers the discounted points that you're adding into it too, that are subtracting out. Um, I used four, I did four as a rough estimate, it's a six years, so take about six years to make that up. So if you think you will stay in the house and not refinance for six years, paying the 2,000 is a good inv investment because of the present value of the $34, $38. How long is it gonna be? Uh, otherwise you should take the 12, per 12, and you know how to do this. We talked about, it's just, it's an application, a TVM, a direct application um they're actually in when it comes to credit um and mortgages it's not just one thing oops hold on
we talk about the five C's in the credit and mortgage industry. There is um, collateral. There is credit. There's what's called character. There's conditions. And give me just a second. Um, I just had a So those are your five C's. And this is the basic, but it's not in, I mean, not in a particular order. Uh, collateral actually is what are you going to put up to, and this is the uh, flow for any loan credit, um what are you going to put up as a security for that loan that you're considering uh capital is what how much cash or other assets do you have we look at your assets and see what is there if you can't make the payment um characters looking at the individuals who are borrowing the money how what have you done historically what's your credit report that's what the credit reports for is to see how you've handled uh, other um borrowings like credit cards conditions look at the economic macro and microeconomic conditions and see um, where the economy is going and so that uh, do we want to get involved long term or short term and capacity looks at uh, as a whole what can you pay the loan let me look at your income uh, that would be an income review and seeing uh, where you work how long have you been working if you short term tends to be even shorter uh, if you have a history of short-term employment or temporary employment or part-time employment, then it's going to be hard for a, in a bank or a financial institution to invest in you so that you they, that they, you can have that mortgage because um, they want to see some long-term, uh, not just long-term past history, they want to see some future history, some probability or possibility of future employment. So these are the five C's that are used in credit investigation. It'd be helpful to know that. Um, not just for this chapter. Uh, it's going to be helpful to know that for uh, your own personal life. Um, when you get to, a, get to that point, uh, when you can't afford to live on your own after you get your degree and you buy a house. Uh, so collateral here is what I'm referring to also the real estate that's being financed what is the value of that what is the uh can, where is the what's the neighborhood 
What's the probability of that appreciating in value and how much could it be? There's, a, there's calculations in here. Uh, the down payment is your con contribution uh, against that house and the purchase. How much you're putting in in cash. Um, this is outside of those points. And um, PMI, stay away from this, by the way. This is a, this is a, a scam. I say that in air quotes because it's a, it's part of the mortgage industry, and I'm not saying it that somebody has created this. PMI star stands for private mortgage insurance. It's uh, an insurance, but it's only for the loan. Uh, it's it's an insurance for the loan in case you default, then the bank gets their money. It's got nothing to do with you as a borrower. You don't get anything for it, but you're paying a premium to insure the lender, not the borrower, and so. It's just extra money that you're paying uh, for their credit risk to mitigate their credit risk. Um, as I said, credit history, employment history, these are part of the capital. I mean, uh, capacity um, for uh, credit history shows the character of the borrower, and um, the, the employment history here shows the capacity to continue to pay. Uh, so that you project that that's going to be a long-term employment, things like that. Um, FICO stands for – oh, I forgot what FICO stands for right now. You don't have to know it. It's not required. I'm just curious. It's a curious um, – um, piece of trivia. It's a cu curious piece of trivia. Um, do you guys know your credit score? Don't tell me. You, that's a private information. But do you guys know what your credit scores are? Yes, I do. Oh, good, good. Alex? Uh, no, I don't. Creditkarma.com. Sign up for that, yeah, Alex. Yeah, if, you're, like if you're interested, it's free. It's a free service. They free monitor your credit. If you sign up for it and just send, put in your Gmail and your personal information, they monitor your credit reports out of two different bureaus, TransUnion and Equifax, um, or the new name for it, Equifax and Trans, TransUnion changed their name. But there's two bureaus that they go against they look and compare that information and give you reports. Uh, and you can go in there all the time and check yourself out. It will give you both credit scores. Uh, uh, Juliana, is that what you use? No, I use Mint. Mint, OK. Yeah. Mint is actually a good um, program, too. Mint has, um, it's a budgetary app, helps you budget and reminds you when bills are coming due. Mint also does have this, um, part of their app is this uh, credit part too. Uh, credit Karma only does the credit report. Um, and I'm trying to remember the date when the federal government instituted that everybody gets a free credit report. Um, and the federal government instituted a law stating that every individual is, uh, can get a free credit report to check your own credit. Uh, before that law went into effect, each credit bureau charged money if you wanted a credit report. And you only found out anything about your credit when you applied for a loan. And that would be if it denied, they say, well, you got too much credit out there, but you don't ever really know what else is out there. Uh, accounts that you think are closed are still open will drag your credit score uh, down. Um, so th that's when the law went into effect so that people can do it, but you could get it from each there at that time, there were three bureaus and you could order it from each of the three, you know, every four months, you can order a report and get it free every year, get from Equifax. And then you go to TransUnion, then TRW, which is the old business. Uh, back then there were three and you could every four months, you can get a new report for free. Uh, now we have these credit uh, um, watchdog apps like Credit Karma, like Mint. Uh, there are others where they will monitor your credit and alert you of certain things that are changing. Good thing to have. 
um, if you start now, you'll be able to see changes. It alerts you, oh, your credit score has changed this week, or there was a different change, or an account has been added. Did you add it? Things like that. I get from Credit Karma, again, it's free, and I get that type of uh, alerts um, on my credit report. Uh, it was a great thing. I was just looking at it the other day for free. Good thing. So I suggest you doing that for your own personal use. Um, now, loans, mortgages can come in actually two flavors, maybe a third if you talk about the uh, balloon, but they're either fixed rate or variable rate or ARM. Um, the term is ARM, stands for adjustable rate mortgages. And that's what's currently out there. Um, until the 80s, We have fixed rate and then we have adjustable rate mortgage um, came into existence in the 80s. So that was a new product in the 80s. It became pretty popular when the rates were falling um, at near the end, in the beginning and mid middle of the 80s as rates were falling, arms became a popular selling tool um, because the rates were falling down. That's where the adjustments happen. That every year the uh, interest rate adjusts. Um, so you're and some and some arms the payment adjusted. So as interest rates were falling, then your payments were starting to shrink. But once the, once the uh, interest rates start to pick up again, then you're paying more. Either the payments adjust or they add interest. Um, those are two different methods of with the arm. You don't know it until you read the fine print. I would stay away from arms too. I don't promote arms. But they still exist. They're just very hard to sell nowadays, especially with interest rates rising. Nobody wants an adjustable rate because as soon as you sign up for it, the rate's going to change again. We know that. The Fed, Fed has already said they're going to may most likely raise it again in the beginning of uh, 23. And they actually, actually it was the plan a year ago that they were planning on doing something that's actually going to be in 23. They just uh, um, accelerated that plan. Um, each payment, which is a fixed payment, a fixed rate would be tend to be a fixed payment. Um, you pay a portion of that payment as interest, a portion as principal, and you usually actually pay, um, it's almost like a 60-40 split, 70-30, uh, 60-40 split, where in the beginning of the term, you're paying more interest in your payments and the principal goes down slower. At about 15 to 20 years in a 30-year mortgage is when it kind of flips and you're paying more principal and less more um, interest. It's just the nature of how the interest of the spread is. And um, here's a, an amortization schedule for uh, certain payments that happen in a 30-year loan, $130,000 at 8.5%. In the first payment you make, your monthly payments, notice that the third column there, the monthly payments is the same, 999.59. So about $1,000 a month is what is the interest. I mean, excuse me, the payment, um, but notice how much is applied to interest and versus principal in the first year. Now of that nine hundred ninety-nine thousand dollars, nine hundred twenty is interest only, and about seventy, eighty bucks is paid towards principal. As you see, that as we get further and further closer to the end, uh, see the one eighty mark. That's about halfway mark. At the halfway mark you're still paying about three quarters of that payment is still going to interest. Um, and about one quarter of that in, uh, payment is going towards principal. You notice that here at the bottom, the very last payment, um, $7 is going towards interest while the majority of that payment is now finishing up the last bit of principal. So that's just the nature of it. The sooner you can get out of an, uh, a loan, the better because you paid if you added up all this interest you actually paid quite a bit
about twice to three times, depending on the interest rate, uh, t three times your principal in interest alone. Um, we could cal we could calculate the future value of this 130 at eight and a half percent for 30 years um, with a freak of monthly uh, compounding and find out what the future value is, and you'll be surprised at how much you're actually paid of that 130 total. Of the, all the paying in principal is 130. That's all you got. Um, that's the 30 year is called a conventional mortgage. It became conventional because everybody was that's the convention. We were all getting 30 year mortgages all the so the conventional um also is that based on the five c's i talked about that's what's considered prime a prime loan um you've heard about subprime you probably heard a lot about subprime if you heard anything about the great recession um prime is your good character good uh, capacity all those are good 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 um and again, a conventional mortgage is usually fixed. And here's the arm I mentioned. Don't get involved in the arm. Um, other types, uh, a second mortgage is not a separate type, by the way. Uh, second mortgages are just, uh, you can get a um, mortgage to buy the house. You have equity, you can tap into that equity, which is, so a second mortgage is called an equity loan. It's but well, what's the value of the property over and above the principal amount of the loan? If you bought a $200,000 house and used $100,000, you have $100,000 in equity, which means you can get a second mortgage or an equity mortgage um, in addition to up until uh, in, that will use up that additional $100,000. Um, graduated payment mortgages, the, some of these types are not, very popular um growing equity mortgage i've not even heard of uh reverse annuity mortgage that's the uh, reverse mortgages um that is dangerous but it's only dangerous to elderly people once they pass away uh and that's when the mortgage company will come in and say okay we're taking the house now it's ours that's where the reverse mortgage is hurt is the survivors of elderly people that signed that up in the first place never know um this is where i'm going to stop i think i'll stop here with my lecture it's a pretty good time stop here uh we'll pick it up on thursday any questions no uh, not for me okay let's call it uh today we'll do this uh, stop right here i'll stop the recording and then i'll try to post this as soon as possible let's see here Stop.